Well, David, as we finish our uh, conversation, uh, we wanted to turn to two other uh, complications of chronic pancreatitis. One is uh, one that particularly fascinates me, and that's the diabetes that develops in these patients. And another is uh, probably the most feared complication of the disease, and that's pancreatic cancer in these folks. I wonder if you could give us your thoughts on those two conditions. Well, uh, diabetes is a common disorder, and uh, certainly we're familiar with type 1 and type 2 diabetes that many of our patients have. In addition, patients with chronic pancreatitis can develop what's called type 3C. And this is diabetes that's caused by destruction of the pancreas and all of the islets rather than just uh, the uh, beta cells and uh, is, um, has some important features. Uh, probably the most important thing is that the loss of uh, pancreatic polypeptide and glucagon means that the uh, patients with diabetes from uh, pancreatitis are at risk of having a hypoglycemia. And this can occur quite often if there's not careful attention to uh, the treatment of these patients and the, and the fact that the counter-regulatory hormones as well as insulin are missing. And uh, many patients have uh, suffered a lot of harm by uh, not paying attention to that. Now, I want to back up just a minute and talk a little bit more about the uh, strategy of caring for patients with uh, pancreatic disease with uh, glucose intolerance and diabetes. The pancreas, uh, endocrine and exocrine part, work as a team. And normally what happens is with a meal, the enzymes are released to digest the nutrients and insulin is released as well. As the nutrients are digested and entered into the bloodstream, the timing is perfect for insulin to be released, and so the signals for the muscles and other cells to take the nutrients out of the blood is coordinated. In patients with uh, pancreatic exocrine insufficiency, uh, there is a problem where there may be asynchrony between when the uh, uh, nutrients are actually digested and when the insulin's released. And this is confounded when the endocrinologist is trying to time the insulin with a meal rather than absorption. So one of the things that's very important is making sure that patients that have glucose intolerance are treated aggressively with pancreatic digestive enzymes. And the reason for that is twofold. First of all, the early digestion and significant digestion of nutrients in the, in the upper GI tract, especially the duodenum, signals the pancreas through a number of hormones called incretins. And what this does is stimulates the release of insulin and helps the deposition of the glucose. So you want to have the digestion and release of uh, the insulin synchronized as uh, you would get with normal physiology. The second thing is that if the uh, meal passes to the lower GI tract before being digested, it can release the ileal break hormones, such as peptide YY, which actually inhibits pancreatic secretion and messes up your ability to kind of calculate how much uh, digestion is occurring. The second thing that is uh, emerging as a potentially important concept is how do you treat patients with uh, moderate pancreatic endocrine insufficiency and glucose intolerance? There is some evidence that uh, metformin might be the preferred uh, um, agent, oral agent to give, because it uh, does not aggravate the uh, problem with the lack of uh, uh, glucagon and pancreatic polypeptide and actually enhances the insulin release. But in addition to that, it seems to have an important anti-cancer effect, preventing pancreatic cancer in a number of studies. They're not all consistent, but the trend seems to be that metformin is one of the most important factors for reducing risk for pancreatic cancer, and these patients are at increased risk of pancreatic cancer. I think, I mean, it's really a very fascinating story to me, um, the, the various steps that occur that make this particular diabetes so difficult to manage and so prone to complications like the treatment-induced hypoglycemia. I know that um, it's certainly something I'm learning about more and more, but it doesn't seem like it's something that the internists I work with and sometimes even the diabetologist are not 
they don't have a high level of understanding of this concept. So it seems like it, the message is not really out there that this is a different uh, uh, diabetes than the type they're, they're using, they're used to treating, and that there are different considerations, particularly in this hypoglycemia risk in these folks. And there's an overlap because uh, the frequency of type 1 and type 2 diabetes as well uh, is a problem. And there are some patients with type 1 diabetes that have uh, pancreatic insufficiency from pancreatic atrophy. And there was an interesting paper uh, recently that looked at the uh, pancreatic volume in patients with diabetes, and it turned out that the patients with uh, an atrophic small uh, pancreas had both a reduction in uh, hemoglobin, excuse me, of uh, uh, C-reactive, excuse me, of uh, C-peptide, and uh, also chymotrypsin, so that uh, the pancreatic insufficiency in these patients uh, was, was probably because of uh, true insufficiency in pancreatic atrophy. So uh, there is some interesting connections there, and, and I, I, you know, I'm just uh, uh, saddened by the realization that so many of the patients that had complaints of uh, various types uh, that we thought was due to just complications of alcoholism you know, may have been real problems that were overlooked or ignored or confounded by other factors. And now that uh, we're paying attention to it and recognizing that these patients are usually not alcoholic and have a complex disease, now we're able to start recognizing these things and I think delivering much, much better care. Certainly within diabetes, it seems that uh, some of the patients we see with chronic pancreatitis may have something that's similar to type 1. Many of them have a type 2 diabetes. That is, they still make insulin, but they developed an insulin resistance as part of a metabolic syndrome, which is separate from their pancreatic disease in some ways, but has a rather you know, well-established treatment paradigm. And then the patients you were talking about, this type 3, in whom I think um, a number of special considerations have to be brought to bear to manage those folks appropriately. One of the biggest... Um, most common questions I get from patients is, um, I know that chronic pancreatitis is a risk factor for pancreatic cancer, and I don't want to get pancreatic cancer, and so I want some surveillance program to, to identify it early. And that's uh, a challenging conversation to have because we don't have proven, at least yet, or well-established uh, surveillance paradigms for following these folks, with the exception of perhaps a few subset like hereditary pancreatitis. Yeah, we don't have the answer uh, in hereditary pancreatitis, but we certainly have the problem. Uh, we've been following these families uh, since about 1995, and we have uh, been sh just really surprised by uh, an interesting fact, and that is some very large families with severe hereditary pancreatitis beginning in early childhood have never had a case of pancreatic cancer, and other families are devastated by it. And it looks like there may be genetic factors or other things that contribute to this to put people either at very high risk or lower risk. Interestingly, a very important study of hereditary pancreatitis in France showed that patients with chronic pancreatitis and diabetes were at very high risk, just like patients with chronic pancreatitis and smoking. So that is another risk factor. Uh, the reality is, is that it's impossible to follow these patients in a screening method uh, because of the distortion of the pancreas because of the, the disease. We are uh, teaching our patients ways of trying to reduce the risk of, of cancer through things we know. Stop smoking. Uh, you want to have a healthy diet, low in red meat, high in, in vegetables and nutrients, uh, attention to, to diabetes if there is use metformin, those types of things. Some patients just live in, in constant fear and require or demand a, a total pancreatectomy. Um, others don't want to know. Um, so we're continuing to try to find ways to study these patients and understand who really is at risk of pancreatic cancer and who isn't. Uh, but currently, I'm, I'm sorry to say, there is no good screening method that we have, and risk reduction is the best that we can offer. I think that's really worth emphasizing that the importance of risk reduction, because there are things we can do within individuals and within families 
to reduce the risk, not eliminate the risk, but to reduce the risk. And certainly the smoking story is one thing that I think is worth spending a lot of effort when you're talking to patients, when you're talking to families, of just how critically important that is in terms of the cancer risk. And I guess the data for most patients with chronic pancreatitis is that about 4% or so over the course of their lifetime will develop pancreatic cancer separate from the hereditary group, which is quite a substantial percentage of patients. Yeah, that's, uh, that's true, and the, um, uh, the approach, as you said, has to be uh, risk reduction, and uh, you know, family history is also very important as well, just like in other types of cancers, such as colon cancer, breast cancer, and others. So those are the kinds of things that we use to weigh out a decision whether or not uh, we would agree with the patient's concern or uh, uh, you know, be less uh, concerned because uh, of a healthy lifestyle and, and no family history. On behalf of Dr. Forsmark and myself, we would like to thank you for participating in this educational activity. We hope you will find it helpful.